Thank you, Bill. Can you give Bill a hand? Appreciate people like Bill and Jonathan and Marsha that do those transitions. I appreciate you. I, I really didn't want worship to end. I was thinking about asking the worship team to just come on back up here, you know? Um, there's powerful things that happen when you worship. And it's even, in my opinion, it's even more powerful when you didn't come feeling like it. And then you told yourself, it don't matter. I'm going to do it anyhow. And uh, I was reminded this morning of, uh, and you can turn in your Bibles to Genesis 37. I'm going to start a message series today called From the Pit to the Palace. And, um, but before I get there, I, I was uh, reminded by the Lord this morning in Acts chapter 16. And come to find out, my wife is, is teaching the children about this today too. So I, I took that as a confirmation that maybe I should mention something about this with y'all. It's good to see y'all. Y'all doing all right? You know what, before, be, before we get into it, could you just put a hand on a shoulder next to you? And let's pray. You're not here just because it's Sunday and it's church time. You're here today because you have an appointment with God. Okay, you have an appointment with God right now. And I want you to just, the person that you're touching right now, just pray for them. Just intercede for them right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for the person next to us. Lord, that every, every bit of themselves would be completely tuned in to the voice of your Holy Spirit today. And so in the name of Jesus, we intercede for them. We bind every distraction. We bind every demonic spirit that thinks that it has control and a hold on them. And we command their freedom in the name of Jesus today. Lord, we pray for them that whatever the needs are, if they're financial, if they're physical, if they're emotional, if they're spiritual, whatever's going on, Lord, we just thank you that you are the God that comes through. You are the Lord God who heals us, Lord. You are the one who restores us, Lord. And Father, we do pray for them that they would receive what you have for them today, that there would not be a demon in hell that would be able to stop them from being able to have your truth and your power today. And we thank you for that, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that even after we're done and we leave here today, that that same power that we know is here right now within us and around us would go with us throughout the whole week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16, you can turn there if you want, but I really want you to be in Genesis 37. But the story is uh, Paul and Silas, they're in prison. And um, if you know this story, what happened was there was this lady, this, this young girl that was kind of following them around and saying, hey, these people are with with God and you know yeah they're servants of the most high or these guys are sweet and awesome they're anointed by the Holy Ghost whatever right just making an announcement making a bunch of noise letting everybody know and finally um, you know Paul just decided he had enough of all this and he said come out of her and people got upset see the people that owned her see because people who People who enslave you, they get mad when you get free. So she got, she got set free, and as a consequence, Paul and Silas get thrown in prison. Because um, you, just, you can't mess with people's money, right? I mean, anybody around here spent a little time in the hood, a little bit? Anybody? Wave at me, you know, a little bit. Not everybody's from the suburbs in here, right? And... You know as well as I do, you mess with somebody's money, and there's people get upset. People love it if you can stay bound, especially if they can make money off of you. If everybody gets free, then there's no reason for a trap house. You, you, that trap house is going to have to turn into real estate, and a realtor is going to have to sell that thing. People start getting free. There's, there's, there's no need for a lot of stuff. And so Paul and Silas get put in prison. Well, before they're in prison, it says in the Bible that they were severely beaten. 
severely beaten, I wouldn't be in the mood uh, to worship and to praise. I, I really wouldn't be in the mood. Um, and I think about that because when I have days where I don't really feel like praying or I don't really feel like worshiping, when I, when I have those, those moments, I think of, well, it's not like I got beat severely like these guys did. And so they, they get put into prison. The Bible says they don't just get put in the prison. They get put into the inner prison. It's bad enough to get put in prison. Now you're in the inner prison. And the reason why the, the, the Romans had an inner prison is it was darker. It was more isolated. And it made it more difficult for you to escape. So if you had some kind of way of being an escape artist, it was, it was to slim your chances. Okay? And for some reason, they, didn't, they were worried about these guys escaping. I don't know why. I mean, they were just preaching, right? They're just preachers. And um, so what happens is the Bible tells us that at the midnight hour, everybody say the midnight hour. What the midnight hour represents is it represents a moment in your life where you're, you're, you're at the breaking point of things being at the end. The midnight hour is that time that represents, God, if you don't come through now, then I'm done. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Anybody been there before? Yeah. Right? So at the, at the worst of the worst, at the most down that you can get down, so far down, you got to look up to see bottom. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you didn't turn around until that point. And they start praying. This is what the Bible says. They start praying. And they start praising God. As they did that, it says everyone in the prison can hear. And then an earthquake happened. And the chains fell off of them. Now, you've got to understand, it is most likely that Paul and Silas were not in the prison by themselves. Okay. And in this inner, in the down, lower, inner prison, there would be a lot of different people in there, right? I guess kind of like county, where they just throw everybody in there, right? So they have, there's a bunch of people in there, you can assume that. And they, they didn't put men and women in different prisons, they just put them all in the same one. And what they would do is they'd chain them up together, so they'd all be chained up together. Okay? And so here's what the Bible tells us. The earthquake happens, and all of the shackles come off of all of them. Even the ones that didn't worship God. Because it was enough to just be in the atmosphere of freedom. I'm, okay. Do I need somebody doing a little to help you all or something? I don't... I don't have that here yet, but one day I'm going to. There'll be somebody who's always doing something, however they do it. But see, in the, in the atmosphere of prayer and praise came the freedom of God. And everyone was affected by it. The doors flung open of all the prison cells. All the chains fell off. The jailer freaks out. And he says, I got to get my sword and kill myself because I'm going to get punished for this. They're, they're out of here. And Paul goes, hey, 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 we're not going anywhere. Just calm down. We're here. Nobody left. Which is totally different. I, I would feel like I'm out. I'm out. I'm out of here. But thank God Paul is a little more sensitive to the Holy Ghost than than me and, and probably most of you as well, I'd, I'd imagine. Um, and the jailer says, what do I have to do to be saved? And then Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. Now check this out. This is all, I mean, guys, this is all happening in prison. Okay? This is all happening in prison. He shares the good news with this prisoner, with this prison guard. He gets saved, and his whole household gets saved. And check this out. 
they, they all got baptized as well. This is what the Bible tells us. They got saved and they got, where? In the, in the jail, in the prison. Severely beaten. What introduced all of this? What made all this happen? They decided to pray and praise God. So listen, um, be encouraged today. At the midnight hour, at the worst of the worst, when you're in the inner prison, like you might not physically, like physically you're not in a prison right now, but some of you are still in prison right here. And I think that's the word that God wants to deliver to many of you today is you're in prison right here. And it doesn't need to stay that way. It doesn't need to continue being that way. Man, if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I'm still, I'm still in trouble. I still want to put that stuff in my veins. I still want to smoke that stuff. I still, I still want it. And I don't, I don't want to want it, but I want it. And I feel, and I feel so bad. I feel, I feel terrible that this is inside of me, that I desire that and that I want that. Listen, be patient. God's being patient with you. You be patient for a moment. Come on, somebody listen to this preacher today. Listen, be patient. Be patient. Because God is working things out. And Philippians tells us that he will work on you and give you the desires that pleases God. Okay? But here's what you got to do. It's constant submission. It's constant surrender is what it is. It's constantly saying, Lord, I... I need you. Lord, I surrender to you, God. I, I don't want to give in to my flesh, God. I don't want to give in to these desires. Change my desires, God. Change who I am. And, and here's something else we need is we need to say, Lord, help me see that that's not who I am anymore. How many of you would love for the Lord to help take the craving out of you? Huh? Be honest with me today. You got a craving of something that you know you shouldn't have and you want God to take it out of you, stand up right now. Stand up. You say, God, I want that craving out of me. Come on. Come on, stand up. Lift your hands up to the Lord. I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to just start walking through this place and start doing something powerful inside of you right now. Jesus, I just thank you right now, God. I thank you. Lord, when you walk into the room, everything changes. Holy Spirit, would you move through this room right now and you see the people standing in the hands up and they said that they want their craving to change. God, in the name of Jesus, would you sat supernaturally right now, God, take the taste away for what kills. Take the taste away for what separates, God. Come and take away that hunger for things that only destroys, God, and put a craving inside for life, Lord God, life and life abundantly. Come on, say, Jesus, come and change the craving inside of me. Come on, say, Jesus, I want you more than I want that. Come on, Lord, transform my mind and transform my heart. Lord, I renounce the devil. I renounce the substances. I renounce that alcohol abuse, Lord, that taste for alcohol. God, I renounce the things of my flesh. I renounce them. I don't believe that that has to be me for the rest of my life. Come on, say that. I accept your grace and your freedom today, Jesus. Come on, Jesus, do a blood transfusion right now. Lord, come and break every chain right now. God, for that, that person who's on the verge of suicide, we break that suicide in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of death and destruction and self-hatred right now in Jesus' name, and we command you to loose that person right now, those people right now that have been thinking about ending their life, God. Help them see that there's real life and there's hope inside of you in Jesus' mighty name. 
Come on, if you believe that God is strong enough to change you, just say, I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and praise God. Come on. Go ahead and praise him. Praise the Lord. Come on, the place of ruin turned into a place of revival. And God can do that again. I really hope you believe it. Because he, he told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I really hope you believe that Jesus is powerful and he's strong enough. Stretch your hands over this way. Stretch your hands over this way. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our sister. And we ask you, God, to completely heal her heart, heal her mind, and deliver her. Set her free today in Jesus' mighty name. For her and the whole family, Lord, we pray for a, just a powerful movement of revival in the whole entire family. And we just pray for your healing touch over her. We command every wicked, foul spirit that goes all the way back to generations past. We command them to lose their grip and to go right now in Jesus' name. Come on, I want everyone in the church to be a part of this deliverance right now. In the name of Jesus, we command your freedom because the Bible says who the Son makes free is free indeed. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So in the name of Jesus, we demand it right now. And we command it in Jesus' name. Let her go. Loose her right now in Jesus' name. There is no power in hell that is greater than Jesus. And we command you to go. Loose her. Free her right now in Jesus' name. Come on, everybody say this with me. Say, in the name of Jesus. Let her go, right now. Come on, in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name, hallelujah. Jesus' name. Come on, keep praying. Keep praying. It was Jesus who said that this will be a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for her and everyone she represents in her family, Lord. God, clean the whole bloodline. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Thank you, Lord, that Lorena has submitted herself to you. And she gets to be free in Jesus' name. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, is there about three or four ladies of the Lord in this church that would go give her a hug right now? Go and give her a hug and tell her how much you love her. Come on, give her that Holy Ghost hug. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to start preaching here in just a moment. Are you guys ready? Come on. The Lord is moving. Come on. Give God praise. Come on, Pastor CJ was just saying, remind you guys that don't be scared. It's not a scary thing that's happening. When somebody is encountering the Holy Ghost and there are other spirits that they've been battling with, those spirits don't like it. And, and this is what those spirits will do sometimes, is they will manifest this way. They'll scream and yell and holler because they don't want to let go. Okay? And some... They don't have a choice, and sometimes it just takes persistent prayer. So even as I'm preaching, I want you to know there's a handful of people that are continuing 
to intercede because guess what, Revolution Church? I want you to be introduced to the new normal here. Okay? In this church, people will be delivered, they will be healed, they will be saved in this church, okay? And it will also happen out there because those of you who have submitted yourself to discipleship and learning, you're going to take what you get in here and you're going to take it out there. You're going to take it to the marketplace. You're going to take it to the streets. You're going to take it to your neighbors and your family. And people are going to get saved, healed, and delivered inside the church and outside the church. You don't have to say, I need to hurry up and get this person to church so that Pastor Alpha can preach to him. You've got the power of the Lord inside of you if you're a believer. And you're able to be used by God to bring salvation in that house and freedom to the captives as well. Amen? Okay. Okay. Come on. Genesis 37. Are you ready? I've got to drink some water here for a second. I'm sorry, but not sorry. I, I can't be one of those pastors that believes that my primary job is to provide you with the church service that starts on time and ends on time and is crisp and clean and quiet so that you can come for an hour and a half and just go home. I'm not one of those pastors. You're going to have to find another church if that's what you're looking for. Okay? I really want the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do at any given time, and he has permission to interrupt my service whenever he wants to. Amen. So I just wanted to put that out there in case anybody was wondering. And, um, and I hope it's all right with you, but if it's not, I still love you. Uh, send, your, send your hate email to Bill, not me. Um, but I think that you guys are fine. So let's get in the word. Genesis 37 verse 1 says, So Jacob settled in the land of Canaan where his father had lived as a foreigner. And this is the account of Jacob and his family. That when Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. And he worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. So so he was a little bit of a tattletale. And so Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Uh, so he was also spoiled. So, so one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe, uh, but his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them and they couldn't say a kind word to him. One night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain, and suddenly my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. And his brothers responded, so you think that you'll be our king, do you? Do you actually think that you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. You, you see, what it, see what it says? his dreams, and the way that he talked about them. So he maybe he was young. He was 17. Maybe he bragged a little bit. Maybe. Maybe he showed off a little bit like, check out the coat I have that you don't have. You know what I mean? And dad loves me more than you, and check it out. God's been giving me some dreams, and you're all going to be my servants. <laughs> yep. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and, and 11 stars bowed low before me. And this time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. And his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. Soon after this, Joseph's brothers uh, went to pasture their father's flocks at Shechem. And when they had been gone for some time, Jacob said to Joseph, your brothers are pasturing the sheep at Shechem. Get ready, and I will send you to them. I'm ready to go, Joseph replied. Go and see how your brothers and the flocks are getting along. So Jacob said, then come back and bring me a report. So Jacob sent him on his way, and Joseph traveled to Shechem uh, from, their, from their home in the valley of Hebron. When he arrived there, a man from the area noticed him 
wandering around the countryside. What are you looking for? He asked. I'm looking for my brothers, Joseph replied. Do you know where they're pasturing their sheep? Yes, the man told them. They have moved on from here. But I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph followed his brothers to Dothan and found them there. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into this empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Uh, Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off the beautiful robe he was wearing. Then they grabbed him and threw him into the cistern. Now the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. Then just as they were sitting down to eat, they looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. And it was a group of Ishmaelite traders taking a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain by killing our brother? His blood would just give us a guilty conscience. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our own brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, uh, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brothers pulled him out of the cistern and sold him to them for 20 pieces of silver, and the traders took him to Egypt. Sometime later, Reuben returned to get Joseph out of the cistern. When he discovered that Joseph was missing, he tore his clothes in grief. Then he went back to his brothers and lamented, the boy is gone. What will I do now? Then the brothers killed a young goat, dipped Joseph's robe in the blood. They sent the beautiful robe to their father with this message. Look at what we found. Doesn't this robe belong to your son? And their father recognized it immediately. Yes, he said, it's my son's robe. A wild animal must have eaten him. Joseph uh, has clearly been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and dressed himself in burlap, and he mourned deeply for his son for a long time time and his family all tried to comfort him but he refused to be comforted I will go to my grave mourning for my son he would say and then he would weep meanwhile the Midianite traders arrived in Egypt where they sold Joseph to Potiphar an officer of Pharaoh the king of Egypt Potiphar was captain of the palace guard so who's Joseph Joseph uh, Rachel's son And Rachel was actually barren, so Joseph was considered a miracle baby. He was a miracle baby, probably why he was the favorite. And Joseph had 12 brothers, and Joseph was 17 years old when the Lord began to give him dreams. He shared his dreams with his family. He had a special gift. He had a special purpose from God. He was young. He didn't know what all of that meant yet, probably still trying to process it. And uh, Jacob loved him more than all of his brothers, got something special, uh, got the special coat of many colors. Joseph was a bit of a tattletale. Um, His brothers hated him. They were jealous of him. They didn't like the favor that was on him. And by the way, all of you that understand that, if you know you're in God's favor, there's people who don't like that about you. But that's all right. Let them deal with it. Um, So... Joseph, he still needed to mature. And I want to share some things with you that I can, I I think we can all grab a hold of and learn about Joseph's life. And I'm going to do this for the next several weeks. So this first thing is Joseph still needed to mature and he also needed to mature in his gifting as well. Okay. And there's some things that we need to think about, things we need to grab a hold of. Gifting does not give you automatic respect. Okay. Okay. That's right. Maybe, maybe you should help somebody. Nudge them a little bit. Because some of y'all think that you're pretty awesome, and you might be. But it doesn't mean you get automatic respect because you have a special gift in a certain area. Okay? Doesn't, I'm, and, I, and you know what? This is for young people and older people. 
great, you got a gift. Don't think that everybody should bow down to you because you're gifted in an area you think you're gifted in or you know you're gifted in, okay? Um, gifting does not give you automatic position. You should never think that you should automatically have a certain job or automatically have a certain title or automatically be looked a certain way by people in the church or, or wherever because uh, you're gifted and then therefore you deserve a certain position. Be careful of that, right? Because all of these things are going to lead to pride. You don't want that, okay? Um, gifting does not make up for a lack of maturity. Your special gift doesn't make up for a lack of maturity. Look at somebody and say, you still have to grow up. It's true, you do. You still have to grow up. Yeah. Gifting does not make up for a lack of discipline. Right? How many athletes have come to a certain level where they started thinking, I don't need to practice anymore. I don't need to train anymore. I'm at the top of the game. There's always somebody who's rising to the top to take your spot, right? Right? So it doesn't make up for a lack of discipline. And you should mature along with your gifting. Gifting's great. And it's from God, right? I think it's 1 Peter 4, is it 4.12 or 4.10? 4.10? says that God has given all of us a gift to do certain things well. And that, that should mature, that should grow in you, but you need to grow up too. Amen? According to 1 Peter 4.10, that's what it is. Everyone has a gift from God. 2 Thessalonians 1.11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may count you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may fulfill every good purpose of yours and every act prompted by your faith. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. Number two, not all dreams are meant to be shared. Every dream you have doesn't mean it's a prophetic dream. And not every dream you should be telling everybody. Maybe you need to tell your journal. Maybe you shouldn't Facebook post everything. How about this? Pray before you speak. Pray before you speak, right? Other people's response to your gift is not your concern. Yeah, that's so important, man. That's so important because some, some of you will allow the gift to be stifled because of what other people say about it. Right? And you, and you can't live according to what everybody else has to say. you got to live according to what God has to say. Amen? And you shouldn't surround yourself with dream killers. What, what happens to, I mean, again, an athlete example, all-star athletes. And what happens? They get around the wrong people. And they start getting into partying and drugs and drinking and all that stuff. And what happens? The opportunity goes away. Why? Because they thought it would be fun to hang out with people who kill dreams. Don't be with people who kill dreams. Don't stay around people that all they do is maybe out of jealousy or maybe out of their own failure. They don't want you to succeed, so they try to get you to believe that you won't succeed because they couldn't. Don't surround yourself around people who are like that. Amen? Amen? Amen. Be, be around people who know how to help mature and encourage the gift of God inside of you. Right? That's one thing that we love to do here at this church. But we're going to also make you work. Right? We all need to serve. You see, when people say, hey, we... Alpha, can I do this? Can I do that? Well, where are you plugged in right now? Where are you serving right now? Oh, I'm not. I just want to do this. We don't do that. 
We don't. We don't say, oh, yeah, go ahead and lead this ministry, but you, you're not serving, you're not giving, you're not a regular attender. I can't help you. Well, can you make an exception? No, not me. Not me because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to do that. Right? As a pastor, you also have to think like a father. I'm not saying I'm the best father, but at least I am one. Right? So you have to take care of what God has given you. You've got to take care of that gift. Greater the gift, greater the responsibility. Sometimes you pay a price for having a gift. Here's what I'm saying. If you know God has called you and he's gifted you in an area of your life, for you to think that you're not going to have to go through any trial, it doesn't, it, it's, does not compute. Okay? You have to understand that there's going to be trial in your life. There's going to be people who give you a hard time. L listen to this. There'll be people who falsely accuse you. They'll say that your motivations are this and that, and they don't even know who you are. They can't even spell your name, and they'll say these things. Why? Because the enemy is always at work, man. So you can't be surprised. You can't go, oh, I can't believe this happened in church. That's why I don't go to church, because everybody's all... What? People? Because everybody acts like people? You go put up with it at work or at the DMV, but you won't put up with it at church? Come on now. You know I had to say DMV because it's one of the worst places to spend your time. Come on, help me one time, Lord. I need a special anointing just for the DMV. The gift, remember that the gift is from God and that God gave it to you for others. He didn't give it to you for you. You got to remember that. That the gift that you have is from the Lord for other people. It's not for you. It's not for you to say, oh, man, how much money can I make from this? And, you know, I need to make sure that I get my worth, you know, and all. Uh -uh. If you start thinking that way, you think in the wrong way. Turn those prosperity preachers off your TV and your feed on your Instagram and stuff and get into the Bible. Come on. The gospel is not for sale, amen? It's already been paid for, come on. I'm not saying that a minister is not worthy of being paid. I'm just saying that your gift is not for you to just find another way of slinging. Right? Trust God and be responsible to use your gift when God tells you to. When God tells you to. You ever been in a conversation? Let me say it like this, okay? I'm, I hope I don't hurt anyone's feelings, but you ever just sit down and eat lunch with somebody you're just trying to hang out? And they got to turn everything into a ministry opportunity in just having a conversation? Learn how to be a regular person. <laughs> don't forget that you're a regular person. You were born a regular person first before you discovered this gift. Don't take identity in the gift to where now every time people are with you and just trying to have a friend and just trying to have a brother or a sister, you don't need to make everything about glowing your gift. Your gift does not need any help glowing. When God wants to do something for his glory, he'll let you know. He will nudge you so hard. It'll be so obvious that he's wanting you to do something. When you get together with people and you're just trying to have fellowship, don't act like you got to always be shining and glowing the gift. Be yourself. You are not your gift. Be you. Can I hear an amen from somebody, right? Okay. Right? Because the gift is for God's glory and it's for the increase of his kingdom, right? And I want to say this. Don't be abusive with your gift. And I mean this, don't manipulate with your gift. Don't try to control people with your gift. Don't try to figure out monetary and material gain with your gift, right? And don't self-exalt. Please stop 
If you get tempted to promote yourself, stop. You don't need to promote yourself. When God wants people to know who you are and what you got as gifting, he'll take care of that. Don't go out of your way trying to always be, don't promote yourself, man. Let God do it. Let the Lord do that for you. Just be, just be, right? Just be yourself, man. Just be the son and the daughter of God that he's called you to be and let the Lord take care of all that stuff for you, amen? Sometimes your gift is gonna get you in a pit. Yes, for those of you who get surprised when you hit these low moments in your life, let me, this is not even a, a, a prof, this is not even a prophetic word. I, I just want to tell you, you it's going to happen to you because it happens to all of us. You're going to have moments where life is the pits. For some of us, we feel like most of our life is a pit doesn't have to be that way. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some things to help you, right? Some, some gifts are going to be followed by some discouraging circumstances. It happens. And I just want to prepare you for it. And you might be sitting in it right now. Maybe you're really, you're, you're really high on the gift right now. And you're like, oh, man, no, this is awesome. Don't talk to me about all that. Well, it's coming. The cistern that's empty is coming, okay? Be prepared for jealousy. Be prepared for betrayal because we are in a fallen world. In a fallen world, people are jealous and people betray people. It happens in the church, outside of the church. You can't get away from it. Because of people's own brokenness, this happens. And you know what? For some of us, we've done it or we might do it, right? Peter said he'd never deny Christ, but he surely did, you know? So we got to be, we got to be careful to not be thinking that we're so higher than we are, right? We all have the capability of falling back. Right? Even if, even if I'm like, oh, I would never betray a brother, how many times have you betrayed Christ? Right? And you know what pits are? They're holding places. They're holding places for transition. Well, I'm, I'm going to... Hopefully you can see this. Some transitions you like and some of them you don't. But the transition's important for where God's taking you. I can't tell you why Joseph's route had to begin with a pit, okay? Because if you know the story, he wound up in the palace and he wound up second in command. Oh, but the journey that he took to get there. And that's why we gotta take these next four weeks to talk about the journey. We can't just cut to the chase and talk about the prize. We need to know the lessons in the journey. It started in a pit. It started with betrayal. It started with jealousy. And guess what? His own flesh and blood came against him. Come on, his own flesh and blood turned on him. Can you imagine the trauma? Could you imagine the amount of discouragement and disorder in his life? He goes from being the favorite being spoiled to he's in the pit and then he gets sold as a slave he was displaced he knew that he was in a place where he didn't belong but I want to tell you something the gifting never left him because he was displaced come on did you hear me today the gifting never left him because of his displacement because the Bible tells us in Romans eleven twenty nine 29 that the gifts of God, they cannot be withdrawn. They cannot be taken away. They are what, Forrest? They are irrevocable. Come on. And in Joseph's story, you'll see that God still continued to bless Joseph everywhere that he went. What was more important is that Joseph found out that he had favor from God. Joseph went through this pattern in his life where people would love him and hate him several times. Did you hear me? They loved him and hated him several times. People would love him. Joseph, you're awesome. 
you're so great. Get in, get in prison. You did what? You did what? He was falsely accused again and again. He was forgotten about. How many times was he left for dead? But each time, God elevated him to a new level in his life. Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we could ask or think or imagine, according to the power that works in us, and that power is the Holy Spirit. Many experience low place events like pits before being elevated to a place of promotion. Listen, if you feel like you're in a pit, you should rejoice because the elevation, the promotion is going to happen. Okay? If you're a person who fears God, don't be afraid of the pit. Look forward to the promotion. Don't try to say what it is. Don't try to imagine that what it looks like because God's thoughts are not your thoughts and his ways are not your ways. You, you'll, be, you'll be fixing yourself on it's going to happen like this and it's going to happen like that. And don't get caught up in that. Just know that it's going to happen. And however God sees fit to do it, praise God for it. Come on. Don't get fixed on a system. Don't get fixed on a certain way. Don't do that because what that will do is it will make you, it will make you miss what God's doing. Because if you try to put God in a box like he has to do it this way because it makes sense to you, then you'll miss a great opportunity because God's not going to do it the way that I want just because it makes sense to me. He's going to do it the way that he wills because he knows what's best for me. Right? Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 26 through 39, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself, and having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, come on, finish it for me. Let's say it one more time. If God is for us, come on. Come on. So what is the purpose of the pit? It's a place of transition and preparation. The pit is not supposed to be comfortable because you're not supposed to stay there. Yeah, come on. I'm speaking to somebody now. Some of you have been sitting in there for way too long, and it's time for you to come out. I'm about to throw you a ladder in a minute. I'm going to throw you a ladder in just a minute. Come on. The adversity that you face could be sent by God for building you, not to destroy you. Not every trial, not every negative moment that you face, not every challenge is an attack from a demon. It's not meant to destroy you. Some of those is because God is making you work those spiritual muscles. He's making you work out. Why? Because he's getting you ready for something. Come on. Everyone who has God's favor will always share in the opposition of haters. It will always... You listen, it happened to Jesus, and he told us, many people hated me, many people are going to hate you. You see what I'm saying? The sooner that we submit to God's work in our heart and in our mind, the sooner that we get out of the pit. Now, let me throw you a couple ladders. And these ladders are this, submission and trust. Those are the ladders that get you out of the pit. Submission and trust. This is where I close the message. I don't know if somebody wanted to come up and play instrument or something. But submission and trust are the ladders that get you out of the pit. You submit to God and you trust God. I really push this kind of stuff hard. I, I mention it a lot. I talk about it a lot because 
we're so programmed in our culture today to, to just gravitate to really quick self-gratification. In, in, in our culture, everything is about being led emotionally, what is going to make me feel good right now in this moment? Like, that's how we're directed. That's how we're led. And it's so deceitful. It's, it's really hurtful because it's causing a lot of damage in so many people. And what really fixes us, what really gets us in a place of restoration and healing and strength is when we first will submit to God and that we'll trust him not a system, not a philosophy, not this is the way that I was brought up, not any of that stuff. Well, I'm this color, so I got to do what everybody in my color tells me. I come from this background and I can't have my homies, you know, no. Listen. Jesus died for me to save me. I have to submit and trust him. And if that means that some people get so mad at me that they don't want to be around me no more, let them go. You don't need anyone attached to your life that doesn't worship the same as you. If they don't trust God, if they're not submitted to God, then you don't need to listen to those people, right? If you're in a pit right now, I want to tell you how you climb out. You submit to the Lord and you trust him. You listen to people who live that way. People who live like that. Man, if they submit and they trust, they trust God and they're submitted to the Lord and they're trying to speak into my life, I want to hear what they have to say. Well, that's not how I was brought up. Some of those things on how you were brought up you got to throw out the window. you got to let them go. They're not of any use to you anymore. The Apostle Paul did that. I threw everything away. As soon as I found Christ, right? That's what Paul said. I'm going to pray and I'm going to excuse us. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone here is going to heaven. The Bible says that if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. There's no way to heaven, no way to the Father except through him. And I want to make sure, is there anyone here that if you died right now, if Jesus was to come back right now, you're terrified that you wouldn't go to heaven? I want to pray with you right now because the most important decision of your life is making sure that you're right with God because the Lord wants to save you. He wants you in heaven. We all want you in heaven. And God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He's got a reason. There's a reason why you still have a pulse. And there's a gift in you, at least one, and he's got a purpose for you. Is there anyone here that wants to surrender to Jesus, wants to submit and trust in Jesus, and wants to walk away from the old way of living, and wants to be a son or a daughter of Christ. I want you to stand up where you're at. We're going to pray with you right now for you to be saved. Okay, I see you. Is there anybody else? Stand up. If you are ready, I see you, brother. Is there anybody else? Come on. Is there anyone else? I see you, brother. Is there anyone else? I see you, bro. Anyone else? I want to ask some of the elders, would you go to these people right now and start, Antonio, you're there. Would you grab one of these guys and start praying with them? Okay. They've got some people coming to you right now, and they're going to just lay their hands on you. They're going to help you pray. Okay. And we're going to all pray together. All right. Listen, for some reason, if standing up in front of everybody kind of freaks you out, I, I, I respect that. I don't want you to think that you can't be saved. Okay. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to make sure that you go to somebody who's considered like a leader, someone who serves the Lord. I want you to go to them today and I want you to tell them, hey, I made a decision 
to start walking with Christ. I'm not going to live the way I was anymore. I want you to make sure you tell them, okay? Let's all pray together, okay? Say this. Say, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sin. I, I confess that you are the Son of God. And Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose again from the grave. And Lord, I want to follow you for the rest of my days. I want to grow in your love. And I want to grow in your truth. Holy Spirit, I want you to come and fill me. Come and fill me up and take away anything that's not of you. I don't want to listen to any spirit except the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I depend on you to help me live for Jesus. You're now the boss. I submit and I choose to trust Jesus. Jesus, I receive your love and grace today. Thank you for welcoming me into the family. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody give God praise, would you? Praise the Lord. Before I let you go, before I let you go, is there anybody who would say, Alpha, I really want you to pray for me because this whole thing you're talking about, this pit stuff and all that, I'm, I'm, I'm needing God to really, really help me and speak to me. I'm, I'm ready to submit and I'm ready to trust. Go ahead and stand up where you're at, okay? I'm not asking you if, you, if, if you're saved or not. I'm just saying you acknowledge that, hey, this is me, man. You're talking about me today. And I'm ready to do that. I'm going to lead you in a real simple prayer, okay? It's not complicated. It's not, there's no abracadabra or nothing, okay? But as I lead you in this prayer, I want you to know it's not the words I speak. It's the words that come from your heart, okay? And here's what I want you to say. Jesus, I surrender. I choose to trust you. Lord, if this pit is from you, then I'll stay in it as long as you want me to. Just make me right, Lord. But if this is from the devil, then I give you permission to deliver me. Whatever you tell me, Lord, that I have to give up, I will give it up because I know I'm not supposed to live in this pit. So, Lord, I thank you right now for setting me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Hey, God bless all of y'all. Thank you so much for coming to church today. Again, make sure you talk to somebody and let them know what the Lord did for you today, okay? Somebody who's good for you that can help hold you accountable. God bless. Have a great day, man. The sunshine's coming. It's supposed to come Wednesday. We'll see. Bless y'all.